Hi there, Sage Kennedy of VO2 Max Productions here with another training talk. Today we're going to talk about ultra race strategy, and I want to thank all those that commented and voted for this topic. I know there's another topic on uh, first aid and getting lost, uh, but when I looked last night, they were tied with the most popular vote. So I'm going to go with this one, ultra race strategy first, and we'll thank Philip for the comment. As always, feel free to comment below of this training talk video for a future training talk topic and vote for your next topic that you'd like to hear discussed on this channel. Again, I really appreciate all the subscriptions, all the shares, and all the support, and I hope your training's going well. Uh, let's dive right into the training talk, though. So, uh, when it comes to ultra strategy, there are a lot of variables, and it depends on the course. It depends if you've done the course before, uh, the course profile, the nature of the hills, I always say, as well as the terrain, determines more your end result than the actual distance. People, you know, get wrapped up like, oh, it's 100 miles, it's, you know, 80 miles, it's 50 miles. Well, you know, a race like, uh, a, a, you know, Vertical K or a short up and down mountain skyrunning race, maybe a 12 mile or 5K, probably has more in common with like the Hard Rock 100 or, uh, you know, UTMB or a really rugged mountainous race compared to 100 miles on a flat track. Likewise, uh, a flat road marathon would have more in common with uh, a relatively flat, tame trail, flat 50K. Uh, it's the elevation profile, uh, the sheer amount of climbing, the nature of the hills, the slope of the hills, and the terrain you're running on, be it snow, ice, mud, uh, technical trail, rocky trail, that determines more than the actual distance. And so, you know, if you have more confidence, if you've done a course before, if you know your strengths are in climbing or descending, then you could usually generally be a more aggressive with your strategy and maybe not necessarily feed off a pack or be as cautious. Whereas if it's your first time doing a race, uh, you've never gotten this distance, maybe the course you're not feeling good on the climbs or whatever, uh, you're probably more likely to settle into the pack. So it is kind of an individual thing based on your experience with the type of course as well as your training, how confident you are mentally uh, in executing a specific race strategy. Now that being said, there are some general thumbs that go through my head, general rules of thumb, I should say, that go through my head while racing ultras. And I'll just kind of use a couple examples in the last uh, nine months that races that ended up, uh, ended up well for me. And that would be the North Face 50 Mile Endurance Championships in San Francisco last December, uh, which I won. On a course that had given me trouble before because A, the first year I ran, I, I got lost and DNF'd. Uh, the second year, I, I didn't even tow the starting line because I got the flu uh, three days before the race. And so third time was the charm. And in that race, uh, it's a very competitive race, $10,000 for the win. Uh, all the Basically all the ultra guys that you know win Western States or set course records at 50 mile races uh, in North America show up for that race as well as some international guys, guys that got second or third at UTMB. Uh, racers like that, so it's a very aggressive race. It's a very deep field, very competitive field. 50 miles, rolling trails, I call them American style trails because they're pretty non-technical. Uh, it's like California, rolling hills, uh, typical 50 mile race with 10,000 feet of climbing. Actually last year it was 51 miles, 51 and a half to be picky, they changed the course a little. But uh, yeah, it ended up being kind of a muddy day, but I was confident in my fitness. And so a lot of times people were like, oh, there'd be a huge pack. And there was probably a pack of, you know, 20, 40, 20 to 40 guys uh, within a minute of each other through the first major aid station at 12 miles and I was sitting kind of in the lead uh, and it's still dark, you start at 5 a.m. in December, go figure. Uh, so I was a little cautious because I, you know, I got lost there um, and so I'm sitting back in the pack. But then strategically when I looked at the elevation profile, and this is what I recommend doing, is look at a course elevation profile ahead of time. Look at Strava data, if you go to strava.com, search an activity, search a race, or uh, you know, a GPS map, you could see exactly how much climbing you're gonna have to do. You could see a uh, percent gradient, percent slope um, of, of how steep the hills you're gonna have to climb. Now you don't know maybe what the terrain's gonna be like, but you could see the nature of the hills. You could see, oh, this is a big two mile climb with you know a thousand feet of 
elevation gain. You could see that and you could try to train for that on a treadmill even if you don't have access to big mountains like most people probably don't. Um, and so I saw there's this big climb around mile 16 and I was like, you know what, I'm going to take advantage of that and I'm going to push the field on that climb. So, you know, climbing's my strength, runnable climbs I should say, not stairs or anything like that, but runnable climbs are my strength. So I, I took advantage of that, I pushed that a little, opened up a lead, opened up a gap. And then once I opened up a lead, I don't want to give up the lead. Um, that's, you know, it was a confident push and 16 miles into a 51 mile race, you have to have full confidence when you make a move like that. Um, granted, you might want to try to make a move later, but it was a serious move. Um, and so I opened up some daylight, maybe 30 seconds a minute on, on second place and the pack was hunting me down and I was being hunted. Uh, but then, you know, later on in the race, trouble happened. I got nauseous, I had stomach issues for the first time. I was throwing up all over the place. I got caught and passed, but uh, I didn't give up. I didn't put my head down. And on the next climb out of Mirror Beach, mile 40, that was after mile 40, it was around mile 40, I think. Uh, there's another steep climb, so I took advantage of that, and that's when I regained the lead and uh, was able to pull away for the win. Um, won that race by five minutes. So, you know, that was a good strategy. Strategically, I ran a good race that day. Physically, I wasn't feeling real great because I was peeling off into the bushes to go to the bathroom, and I was puking my guts out halfway through. Um, drinking too much soda, no doubt. And just the conditions, it was sloppy, it was muddy. Not my favorite. I like dry, firm ground uh, to run on. But you know, you gotta be able to adapt to the conditions and adapt during the race. And I think that's another part, important part of the strategy is have a plan ahead of time. Say, well, I'm gonna you know, try to hit these checkpoints, I'm gonna try to hit these splits maybe. If you've done a race before, you know maybe your previous times through aid station checkpoints. I always write them on my arm. A lot of times if you see pictures from a race, you'll see numbers on my arm. It's either course record splits uh, to gauge myself off of what the fastest person's run on the course, or it's my own splits that I ran uh, from the year before. Um, and you know, just trying to figure that out, relative splits, you might not hit them exactly, but if you're around them, you know you're doing well. And if you're way ahead of them, you know maybe you went out a little too fast. So you definitely want to pace yourself. And uh, yeah, relative efforts basically. So you know, you do what you can and you have to make adjustments on the fly. If nutrition goes sour, and sometimes it does, uh, sometimes you might need more salt instead of just more sugar. Uh, sometimes you'll crave potatoes, salty potatoes, instead of a Coke or instead of uh, more gels or something like that. So you gotta be able to switch it up. Switch up your carbohydrate sources. Switch up whether, you know, if it's hot weather, dehydration is gonna be a limiting factor faster than glycogen depletion probably. So, you know, not just to be drinking a little water, not be dumping water on your head and the back of your neck, putting ice cubes down your shirt or whatever. Um, but taking some electrolytes, sodium, potassium, uh, magnesium, maybe you're not taking magnesium, sodium, potassium, a mix of electrolytes in your drink uh, to replenish the, what you're losing through all of your sweat as well as exhaling. Uh, you exhale a lot of uh, water vapor as well and then you drop a lot of weight in a, a long race. Uh, so dehydration could be a limiting factor if it's really hot and then you know, you're always trying to keep yourself well fueled with a, a steady stream of carbohydrates as well as you're burning fat effectively as a fuel along the way. So it's a fine balance and you want to keep your stomach in check and execute a strategy that's not going to beat up your legs too fast. If a, a race starts with a big downhill like say the Boston Marathon or you know a lot of ultras maybe they'll start with a four or five miles downhill pretty steep. You don't want to sprint that as hard as you can because you're going to blow out your quads. Uh, your muscles are going to die and then you know, 15, 20 miles later, you're not going to be able to go downhill anymore. Some of my worst races, uh, the Tarawera 100K in New Zealand a couple years ago, which I, I barely held on to win, but I was walking on the downhills, but I could still run uphill. And usually, you know, people, it's easier to go downhill in the cardiovascular system, but the skeletal muscular system doesn't care. Uh, if you blow out your quads early in the race with a fast downhill, Later in the race, you're not going to be able to execute that same sort of pace, and it's probably going to hurt your uphill as well, and your flat running. So I guess general uh, strategy um, when looking at pacing is try to do a pretty even, even split um, type of effort. It's going to not probably be a negative split. You're not going to run your second half of your race faster than your first. You're probably not going to run even mile splits. You're probably going to do a slow fade, a slow slowdown. <laughs> so to speak, and it's gonna be an increased effort, of course, 
uh, even if you're running perfectly even splits, the effort increases, uh, so it's very hard at the end. Uh, usually every ultra I've run the last 20 or 10 miles is very, very difficult. Um, and I'm even tired halfway in maybe. But, uh, you know, if you negative split an ultra, and you definitely can, it means you probably went out too easy. And if you really want to be aggressive with things, if you want to push the envelope, a slight positive split's probably your most realistic thing. And now that's if the course is basically perfectly flat or the elevation gains perfectly an even distribution, which it rarely is. But uh, all else aside, if you're keeping pretty consistent mile splits, um, that's usually the most efficient way to go, um, given you know the terrain and other factors, uh, you know changes in temperature during the day or during the course of ultra as well. But you don't want to be falling apart at the end, running, walking. Uh, a bunch of mile splits that are twice as slow as what you started off at because you started off at your marathon pace or your 10k pace or something crazy like that so you definitely need to pace yourself and be patient on the early stages of a race especially for those longer ultras and for those trail races that have a lot of climbing at the end because uh, that's when you could really blow by people and if you're strong at the end if you still have climbing legs you know 40 miles into a 50 miler you're going to be blowing past people on an uphill uh, and downhill uh, who, you know, blew their legs out early on in the race or didn't didn't pace themselves well. And, you know, with the pacing, we're not looking at lactic acid buildup so much. Uh, people usually don't get limited by that as much. It's usually a muscle fatigue or a glycogen depletion or a dehydration type of issue. Uh, I mean, this is as long as you're mentally in it, and you have to be mentally in it, you have to be mentally tough, it's not, it's never easy, there's a lot of pain involved in this sport. Uh, every race I run, I wake up dreading the, the pain, the fatigue, the iron-like uh, vice grip that's just gripping down, just cinching down on you, just saying, slow down, slow down, mercy, I'm in pain, this hurts, this sucks. Um, and you have to persevere against that and push through that, push through the demons that tell you to stop, that tell you to quit. Um, and it, it is tough, you know, it's, it's a hard thing and some days are a lot tougher than others, but it's always a challenge and, uh, you know, people say, oh, this race is harder than this race. They're all hard races. Uh, it doesn't matter the distance or the elevation, really. If you push yourself 100% and you give yourself, you know, you get what you can out of your body, then it's always going to be a constant hard effort. Um, so I think that's another thing to note is, you know, shorter races are just more intense and there's more intense pain faster. So pick your poison, burn yourself with a match or uh, slowly roast yourself over the coals. <laughs> Either way, it hurts a lot. Um, and so you have to be able to push mentally and you have to be able to stay on top of your pacing and looking at the train and your training. Uh, that's what I think at least. Um, Deciding whether or not to break from the pack, again, look at your splits, look at perceived efforts. Maybe on Strava they have a good uh, goal-adjusted pace for some uphills. It doesn't take terrain or elevation into account, though. Uh, but the percent gradient on hills, you could see, uh, especially if you track your heart rate data, too, uh, relative efforts. Because um, if you don't pace yourself early on very well, you're going to burn through your glycogen stores a lot faster. And if you don't take in a lot of carbohydrates, you're probably going to hit the wall pretty hard and you definitely do not want to do that. You want a, a slow and steady stream of energy expenditure and uh, being able to take in consistent things, uh, calories. So that goes with the nutrition plan, is have a nutrition plan as well and don't expect that to go to plan. You have to be flexible. Uh, I've been really lucky. I've had a great crew support from my girlfriend Sandy and my parents and other you know sponsors and friends and help. Uh, hopefully maybe you have some support, you have a, a significant other or a friend or fellow runner that might be able to crew for you, but sometimes they don't make it to aid station. Sometimes they get lost or they get in a traffic jam or, you know, they get a flat tire or whatever. So sometimes you have to, you know, use the aid stations at the race. Maybe you don't have a special concoction. Um, but the, the rule of thumb to that is, you know, drink often, drink early and eat on a regular schedule. Um, Again, I take a V-Fuel gel, usually starting off for the first couple hours at least, every once every 20 minutes. Uh, for other people, maybe that would be once every 30 minutes, uh, and I wash it down with straight water usually. Sometimes a little electrolytes in there, sodium and potassium. Uh, sometimes I'll just grab a banana at aid station. Sometimes, like comrades, I grab salty potatoes when I got desperate. But I, my, I changed that based on my cravings. I was like, I need sugar, then I need some salt. Salt and carbs, sugar is a carb. Uh, 
I mean carbohydrates, sugars, but uh, you want a different stimulus and you maybe sometimes you feel like uh, just plain water is the best way to hydrate as long as you're taking in uh, some sodium and potassium as well, but not too much because uh, that could throw your stomach off. So, you know, have a plan with that. It's not just about the running and physical expenditure. It's also about the nutrition, the mental attitude, um, and the course dynamics, the course, uh, how the course plays into your strengths and weaknesses. And generally, like I said, with the North Face example, and also actually with, I'll do another example, Boston Marathon this year, uh, my, most, my best marathon performance, even though the time didn't reflect it because of the headwind, uh, I had to make a choice about 10K in. I was running with a pack of guys, like the lead pack, you know, the, of all the top, uh, all the top international guys and, uh, you know, the top Americans. Um, one of my buddies, Nick Arseniaga, Jeff Eggleston, Fernando Cabada, um, Meb, of course. Um, gosh, who else is in the race? Ritz, Matt Tegan Camp. Uh, those guys were gone. They were sub five from the gun. I didn't see them. Huge gap though at Boston between the lead pack and the chase pack. So I was in the chase pack with a lot of guys, a couple stragglers maybe in between. Um, huge, you know, headwind coming at us head on after coming down the, the first downhill stretch. And uh, I was going for time and most people weren't, but I was with a lot of pack of Americans and I was with a pack of like 20 or 30 guys running slightly slower than I wanted to run. And I'm looking at the mile splits and I'm like, geez, like if I want to run a, try to run a 218, sub 218, we can't keep doing this. And those guys, um, you know, they were drafting. You, you draft when there's a big headwind. And they were sitting in that pack and I was like, you know, it's a big risk, but I'm gonna break from this pack and I'm gonna just go off all by myself and run by myself. And you know, if you're around 15th or 25th place at Boston or New York or Chicago. Sometimes you find yourself in no man's land like that. And I was in no man's land, uh, but I decided at, you know, eight miles into the race to break from that pack and go out on myself, by myself, on my own, at my own pace, running what I thought was the best pace, and I still think it was the best possible pace I could have run on that day. Uh, even with the headwind, uh, and you know, running by myself for six miles, and it was cold, and I caught a couple other guys, but you know, the drafting was minimal. Um, but that was the right choice because if I stayed back in that pack, I maybe would have finished two minutes slower, and you know, I, I could have drafted more. But I don't. I didn't want to run. I didn't want to have that yo-yo effect of being in the pack, and I didn't want to have to. I don't, usually don't like to feed off of other people's paces because I feel like. Uh, I like to push the mile splits where I want them to be and maybe I want to go up the Newton Hills faster than someone else but I'm not going to let them dictate the pace that I push necessarily. Now that being said, there's a lot of synergy in a pack and it's sometimes, you know, if you're mid-pack in a race, you're probably forced to be running with a lot of people. Some trail races are a lot more crowded than others obviously, um, but you know, if you know you're a good uphill runner you expect to pass people on the uphill. If you know you're a, a good downhill runner, and maybe you've learned this through group runs, you expect to pass people on the downhills. Because if you don't take advantages of your strengths, then uh, you're not gonna be, maybe you're not gonna, you, you might sell yourself short, basically. Uh, so you don't let other people limit you. Now if you wanna, you know, chat up with other people and have fun, you could do that. But if you really wanna reach your potential in the race, uh, you gotta say bye bye to them. and. <laughs> and uh, you know, pass them when the, when the time is right. And usually in somewhere in the middle of the race is usually the best time to really make a move, make a decisive move and to really put down and to put full confidence in that move mentally uh, when you do it. But you know, it's not gonna be a sudden surge. I've done a lot of ultra races where guys do these like hard surges, which you know, in track that's common to do if you're running a short distance, but you don't wanna surge too hard. You wanna do a long, slow, steady, acceleration or brake. Um, you don't want to be sprinting in an ultra or it's gonna, you don't want to make your heart rate skyrocket too much. So, you know, you do a long sustained push, I think is usually the most efficient. And if you really get away from a pack or get away from someone or get away from your own splits from the year before or whatever, um, and you know, do it when you're feeling strong, that's gonna be a good thing. And then it's just a matter of holding on to the finish and trying to not fall apart. Uh, that's what I always think. My motto for every ultra basically has been just don't walk. And usually 
I end up walking a couple steps, whether it's out of an aid station when I have to stop or there's an uphill that hits a grade and I'm far enough into a race where my legs are failing and I'm power hiking. So every ultra, try not to walk, just don't walk, I end up walking. But I try to minimize that and so that's kind of the motto. And so it's good to have a motto, you know, just don't slow down or, you know, just try to get to a certain point um, and keep it together, basically. It's a it's kind of a survival thing. So that's kind of my advice and it's a long training talk, I know, but uh, I do appreciate all the comments and all the shares and all the subscriptions and support. Uh, keep them coming. Hope your training's going well uh, this summer, training and racing. And uh, yeah, comment below for future training talk topics. Uh, I'd love to see them. And thanks again for watching, guys. I really appreciate it. Stay tuned for more via 2 Max Productions. <laughs>